come with me on a fascinating journey to the Alps of Northern Italy and Southern Switzerland. A panorama of breathtaking beauty. Here we find snow-capped peaks in their towering majesty. Rich green valleys watered by clear running streams. Rolling meadows carpeted with fragrant wildflowers. Hillside orchards and vineyards ripening with luscious fruit. This is God's country, almost heaven on earth. But something tragic happened in these Alps many years ago. The snow became red with blood, the blood of God's people. Some heartbreaking yet faith-inspiring history awaits you in this telecast, and a fascinating Bible prophecy, too. It is written. This is George Vanderman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today, from our series on the rescuers of neglected truth, why so many denominations? Why so many denominations? Have you ever asked that question? Probably so. The answer is not at all difficult to find. Let's pause this week in our investigation of individual churches to discover a prophecy in the heart of Revelation, a prophecy which will relieve the confusion many people feel when confronted with so many different roads to heaven. We begin our study here in the Alps, where many years ago there lived a gentle people called the Waldenses. For long centuries, they kept the light of truth shining amid spiritual darkness. The Waldenses preserved the ancient faith once delivered to the saints by Jesus Christ himself and the apostles. Faith which had suffered neglect and abuse by the religious establishment. We'll meet the Waldenses again later in this telecast. But first, let me ask you something. Should the erosion of faith by the Christian church surprise us? After all, the Old Testament records an ongoing affair with apostasy, and the New Testament predicted that history would repeat itself. Once again, a falling away from truth would corrupt true faith, the apostles Peter and Paul both warned. Well, the book of Revelation also foretold the struggles of God's people during the Christian era. Would you come with me to chapter 12? Let's read verses 1 and 2 of the Revelation and the 12th chapter. Listen. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars, then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, who is this woman? Well, in the Bible, God often uses the symbol of a woman to represent a church. A pure woman, you see, to represent his sincere followers, and an immoral woman to represent fallen Christianity. So this pure woman of Revelation 12 must represent God's faithful people. And notice that the woman was with child. A child is under attack. Look at verses 3 and 4. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon. And the dragon stood before the woman, who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. The dragon here is none other than Satan, the mortal enemy of the church. Remember how Satan, working through Herod, the Roman ruler, tried to destroy Christ by murdering all male babies in Bethlehem. But infant Jesus escaped with his mother Mary and Joseph. You know the story. After Christ grew up and began his ministry, the enemy attacked him with a new strategy. He approached the Lord in the wilderness with several shrewd temptations. But Jesus refused to compromise his faith. Enraged, Satan tried yet another tactic. He entrapped the religious leaders with his deceptions. Once he gained control of the religious establishment of that time, the enemy employed the leaders in persecuting 
Jesus. They apparently conquered Christ at the cross, but he rose victorious from the grave to ascend to the throne of God. Notice 5, verse 5, says the same thing. And she, that's the church, bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The devil was thoroughly frustrated in his tax upon the Son of God. So now he turned upon the woman, the church. He attacked God's people with the identical strategy he had tried against Jesus. History repeated itself in a remarkable way. Listen to what happened. First, the devil tried to kill the infant church. He used Roman rulers as his agents, just as he had with baby Jesus. But despite fierce persecution by Nero and his successors, Christianity survived and thrived. Satan realized he could not destroy God's people by violence. So the enemy approached the church with subtle temptations. He determined to lure its leaders into compromising their faith. Many refused to yield, remaining faithful, as the Lord had been when he was tempted. But the enemy did manage once again to manipulate the religious establishment of that day. As in the time of Christ, truth became buried under tradition. God's faithful people, refusing to participate in apostasy, were marked for death, as the Lord had been. History records the tragic story. Read it in any library. Religious leaders martyred millions of sincere believers for no greater crime than faithfully following the word of God. For many dark centuries, the saints had to go into hiding. We see this in verse 6, Revelation 12. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, you see, the church, where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, here we have a time prophecy. A period of persecution lasting 1260 days. Now, are these days literal or are they symbolic? It's helpful to recall that the book of Revelation deals in symbols. Remember, too, that the persecution lasted many centuries, much longer than 1260 actual days. It's more like 1260 years. Is this the time frame indicated by the prophecy, 1260 years? Apparently, because in symbolic prophecy, a day must represent a year. This is what the Reformers taught. Martin Luther and others believed that this time period represented 1260 years of oppression by the Church of the Middle Ages. And history confirms it in the 6th century, the church influenced by Emperor Justinian to issue a, de issue a decree withdrawing all protection from the heretics, as God's faithful ones were called. And that persecution had reached its unbridled fury by A.D. 538. Adding 1260 years to 538 would bring us down a little before our time, 1798. In that very year, Napoleon interrupted the power which had oppressed the faithful. So during those dark centuries, as the prophecy of Revelation 12 foretold, God's people went into hiding. Verse 16 tells us that the earth helped the woman. The mountains of the Alps and other remote, remote places of the earth provided the church protection. She survived. Through it all, the light of truth never went out completely, though it burned quite dim at times. The Walden sees. Come with me to visit their secret chapel called Chiesa del Latana, which means Church of the Earth. On hands and knees, you can make your way down the rocky tunnel to their underground meeting room. In this very cave, perfectly camouflaged by nature, the Walden sees for many years worshipped undetected. But at last came the day when scores of them were trapped here by soldiers who built a fire in its opening. The oxygen was consumed and the Wallensees sang praises to God till breath was gone, glad to give their lives rather than renounce their faith. No, no one knows how many true believers spilled their blood during that long exile of the church 
in the wilderness. But just as God watched over his son, so he preserved his people. And as Jesus came forth from the grave victorious, the church finally emerges from the wilderness hibernation. At this point, I should mention that the word church here does not mean denomination. The Lutheran denomination, the Baptist denomination, the Adventist denomination. No, in the New Testament, the word church from the Greek word ekklesia simply means God's called out ones. Don't you like that? Would you want to be one of God's called out ones? Let's consider an illustration that helps us to understand the experience of God's people in Revelation 12. Suppose, if you will, that you're standing on a hillside overlooking a giant plain stretching for miles into the distance. You notice a railroad track, a single track, crossing the plain, and it disappears into a tunnel. Suddenly, you hear the sound of a train approaching, and there you see it, a grand old Baldwin locomotive with two familiar passenger cars. It speeds along, shall we say, at 70 miles an hour on a single track, you remember. Now, if a black locomotive with its fine Pullman cars disappears into one end of a tunnel, wouldn't you expect the same black locomotive with the same Pullman cars to emerge from the other end? Of course you would. But what if a black locomotive with two fine passenger cars goes into one side of the mountain and up the other side comes a diesel modern train pulling several cars. You would say, something must have happened to the train inside the tunnel. And of course, you would be right. Now, please forget trains for a moment. And let's imagine that the true church started down the track of time at the beginning of the Christian era, picture the church of Revelation 12 with its pure faith riding down the centuries, past the first century, the second century, the third century, and the fourth, and by the year 538, it becomes necessary in order to preserve its faith to go into hiding. And so it disappears into the wilderness tunnel for more than a thousand years. Let me ask you this. Wouldn't you expect the same church teaching the same body of truth which disappeared from sight so many years earlier to emerge from the wilderness tunnel teaching the same message the early Christians taught? We certainly would. But what if out of the tunnel comes not one church, but many churches, many different denominations? You would say something must have happened to it in the tunnel. And of course, you would be right. Church history reveals that something disturbing did happen during the Middle Ages. Truth suffered. It became fragmented. Yet it survived. We have noticed how God intervened to restore neglected truth piece by piece, how he raised reformers one by one to bring back truth which had been forgotten during the long centuries in the wilderness. Martin Luther appeared on the scene to restore the heartbeat of Christianity. And the Reformation was begun, but it was not finished in the 16th century. Light had only begun to break forth in the wilderness tunnel. Really now, could we expect that all of the truths hidden for so long could be recovered immediately, all at once? No, not likely. Luther rediscovered that forgiveness comes by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And so we have our Lutheran church. But the importance of certain other truths was not seen clearly by Luther. Some of these neglected truths that we've already discussed in this series of telecasts, such as baptism by immersion, which was recovered by the Anabaptists. Anabaptists, you see, approached the leading Protestant scholars and urged them to accept this new light. We might have hoped they would, but they didn't. So we have our Baptist church today. And when other truths came through Wesley, the established churches turned him down. That gave birth to the Methodists. The story goes on and on. Do you see our problem? It's the sad human tendency to depend upon the past, to draw a circle about our beliefs, 
and call it a creed. Lock us into our creed. Now, these original creeds helped restate the foundation of Christianity, but they did not make provision for advancing light. And so we have our many denominations today. Remember again what God had said in Proverbs, the fourth chapter and the 18th verse, the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter under the perfect day. Truth, if we follow it, will shine brighter and brighter, even more glorious, always advancing, never retreating, never standing still. By the way, if you wish a copy of today's message, along with the scripts of all the other programs in this very vital series, all you have to do is ask for it. It'll be offered in the closing moments of our telecast today. Can you see what God is attempting to do with his people? He wants to preserve every ray of light each reformer so carefully guarded, adding to them newly discovered truths, which also had been lost through the centuries. Would he not want to present this total package, this message in its original full beauty to a world so desperately in need? And it has been happening, slowly but surely, Truths long hidden have been emerging from the confusion of the dark centuries. As additional truths are recovered, other movements have sprung into existence, each championing newly rediscovered light. Now, let's look at the last verse of Revelation 12. Verse 17. And the dragon, Satan, was arrayed, enraged with the woman, the church. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, here we have a description of God's last day people. Remember, we're not talking about denominations specifically now, rather simply God's people. Did you notice that their twin identifying marks, keeping the commandments of God and holding to the testimony of Jesus, Faith in Christ and keeping God's commandments go together, you see. The Ten Commandments, could they contain neglected truth too? Well, perhaps as a child you memorized them. What about that fourth commandment? Is this not a very neglected truth? Did you ever notice that the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, is different from the others? Nine of the commandments tell us what we must do for God and for our neighbors. But the Sabbath commandment tells us what God has done for us, and he invites us to share in the rest God earned by his work. Let's read that fourth commandment together. What do you say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you will do no work, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The seventh day Sabbath, you see, invites us to celebrate God's work for us as our creator. And there's another reason why we worship God. There's another reason to keep the seventh day holy. Listen, come with me reverently to Cal. It's late Friday afternoon, nearly time to welcome the Sabbath. Jesus, hanging on the cross, recalls all that he's done for our salvation. And then with his dying breath, he proclaims, It is finished. Mission accomplished. Mankind redeemed. Again, Jesus rests on the Sabbath in honor of his finished work, just as he did after creation. Only this time, he rests in the tomb. And following Sabbath rest, Christ rises and ascends to heaven's throne. Now, the idea of worshiping on Saturday, the seventh-day Sabbath of the fourth commandment, may be new to you. Or you may have heard that Sabbath-keeping is legalistic. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. You see, the word Sabbath itself means rest. That's the opposite of works. Each week the Sabbath points us away from human works to rest in God's work for us. And that, my friend, is the gospel. Without Sabbath rest, you see, our obedience to God's law would be legalism. 
Never forget it. We're not saved by keeping the law of God. We're saved by resting in Christ. That, I say, is the gospel. That is also the message of the Sabbath. Amid the essential duties outlined in the law, the Sabbath offers us rest in the work of Christ for us. Now, we understand why Jesus proclaimed himself Lord of the Sabbath. We show our faith in Jesus, our Maker, our Redeemer, by resting on the seventh day. The Sabbath memorializes the greatest things our Lord has done for us, the reasons why we worship him. And this brings us to a question. Since the seventh day, which we call Saturday, is evidently God's day of worship, how is it that most Christians keep the first day of the week, Sunday? Well, we saw in an earlier telecast that the Church of the Middle Ages, without authorization from Scripture, took responsibility for changing the Sabbath to Sunday. As late as the 16th century, faithful Christians here and there still kept the seventh day holy. A number of Anabaptists, for example, observed the Sabbath despite fierce persecution. Well, finally, the neglected, nearly forgotten truth about the Seventh-day Sabbath was recovered, and since the 19th century, millions of Christians around the world have begun worshiping on the Bible Sabbath. What a heritage God has for us today, highlighting the vital truths recaptured by the great reformers. And now in the final glorious moments of the Reformation, still rediscovering truth? Shouldn't we all keep following advancing light? What a challenge for the alert, thinking Christian. Now as we come to the close of this telecast, may I share with you a delightful little story I came across not long ago. A boy was herding sheep for his father, not far away across the valley, a neighbor lad was herding his father's sheep. Well, the boys were good friends. One day a severe storm came up very suddenly, and the boys, the boys with their sheep took refuge under a mountain ledge. When the storm was over and it was time to go home, the boys had a problem. They couldn't separate the sheep. Some of them they knew, and they weren't sure about others. Finally, in desperation, fearful that they would be scolded, they started for home, one down one path and one down another. And what do you think happened? Yes, the sheep just separated themselves perfectly, every sheep following his own shepherd. Do you see, you could take any sheep in those flocks and tell who it belonged to by which shepherd it followed. That's the way to tell. Are you one of Christ's sheep? You are if you follow him as he reveals his truth and his word, whatever that truth may be. And you can make that decision before your Lord just now while we pray. Dear God, thank you for the unfolding evidence of a grand design ushering in the final stages of the great conflict between Christ and Satan in which Jesus in his truth will be victorious. We reveal in this the fellowship with believers of the different persuasions in our search for unfolding truths. In order to be prepared for that final day, we thank you for what we've learned, and we make Jesus our Savior by a personal decision just now. In his name we ask it. Amen. Wouldn't you feel that messages this vital that affect your future and mine deserve a permanent place in your home and in your library? That's what Lonnie's here to tell us about just now. Hello, I'm Lonnie Meloshenko. Seven denominations. That's all we had room for in this book. And I know Pastor Vandeman wishes he had more time to devote entire telecasts to many other groups as well. So many different people and churches have had a part in taking the torch of truth and advancing it in the cause of Christ. I hope you've been challenged these past seven weeks by this special series. Perhaps today's message is a new idea to you, that the Bible Sabbath, still a memorial to our Creator and Redeemer Jesus, may be a long-neglected truth as well. Something to think about, I'm sure you'll agree. 
I know you won't want to be without this valuable book we've been offering for these several weeks. It contains today's complete telecast script and all the other programs in this series, including next week's fascinating conclusion, as Pastor Vandeman tells you what he appreciates about his own church family. Be sure to write or call today for your free copy of What I Like About by Pastor Vandeman. It's our gift to you, free and postpaid. With this book, What I Like About, you'll be able to catch up on any programs you missed, review this fascinating procession of God's recovered truth, and even share with a friend. And now here's the information you'll need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now. That's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open now. That's 1-800-253-3000. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. It hardly seems possible that we've finished seven of our eight programs in the What I Like About mini-series. And such important subjects these are. Only one left. What I Like About the Adventists next week. So there will only be two other opportunities today and next week to ask for your complimentary copy of what I like about the various denominations. Your library deserves it. Bless your heart, ask for it, and we'll send it to you. Also, thank you for your prayer requests and for your confidence in our prayers for you and with you. And thank you for your consistent giving. The financial support you've given to this telecast because it's necessary to keep it going. Now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone, but remember it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Be sure to be with us for our final mini-series chapter as Pastor Vandeman shares with us what he appreciates about his own church family on What I Like About the Adventists. Next week on It Is Written.